Well, our scriptures today is about what happened when a couple of disciples went ahead and followed Jesus up the mountain. So listen carefully to these words from Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With, who, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. God bless this reading for today. It's an interesting scripture. It describes what we call the transfiguration. It's a biblical event that had a huge, huge impact on the Christian church. So let's see if we can gain a better understanding and appreciation for the reasons why that might be. The story begins when Jesus takes only three of his disciples up a mountain, a tall mountain. Not for a healing miracle, but for another kind of miracle. At the top of the mountain, this miracle occurs, a vision of Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, who appears bright white. This incredible miracle in itself does not scare the three disciples at all. Rather, it, it stimulates their nest-building impulses. They offer to build dwellings for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. I'm not sure why. Maybe to protect them from the elements, get them to stick around a little longer. You know, it's cold and windy up on the top of a mountain, after all. Then a cloud gathers over the mountain, and a voice says, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now this scares, really scares, Peter, James, and John. So much that they fall to the ground in fear. Their fear subsides at Jesus' touch, and at that point, the special moment is over. The cloud, Moses, Elijah are gone, and Jesus asks his disciples, say nothing. Say nothing of this experience till after his resurrection. It's not a complicated story. The miracle is not really all that spectacular. Yet its symbolism and message has guided the Christian church since our earliest days. So let's set aside our modern analysis for a moment and consider the original audience and how this text functioned in their minds and how they received it. For early Christians, the belief that God could be approached at the top of mountains was well established. Mountain tops were places where humans could reach closest to the heavens and contact God. Of course, only the dedicated, strong, and brave could make it to the top. To approach God, the small group of men exerted great effort to climb. Have you ever climbed a mountain before? It's tough. And then, when they get to the top after exerting all this effort, God reaches down to be experienced, to reveal some aspect of God's self on that mountain top. First two people are seen, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. The symbolic meaning of Moses and Elijah's appearance is significant and would have been 
multi-layered in meaning to an early Christian believer. For example, Moses would represent to the early Christian the law of God. While Elijah would represent the prophets, the law and the prophets. In this context, God's voice comes from a cloud indicating that Jesus is God's representative, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. In addition to representing the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah also represent different life endings. Moses was human and he eventually died a normal human death. Elijah was also human, but Elijah did not die. According to the Bible, Elijah was taken up into heaven on a fiery chariot. Jesus was also human, but he would do both. He would die as Moses did, and later would be raised up to heaven like Elijah. The significance of this is hard for a modern mind to fully grasp. For the early Christian, this provided great comfort and it demonstrated a solid connection between the God of the Jewish people and the God of the Christians. For these reasons and many more, the early, some early Christian church fathers actually pointed to the transfiguration as the pinnacle of Christian belief as opposed to the resurrection or the birth of Jesus or other events in Jesus' life. This was the, the high point. This is what it was all about. This is a pivotal story of God revealing God's self to humankind. Humans experience in that moment clarity, an epiphany, a vision when God reveals God's self in a surprising and shocking way. In this context, the experience of being in God's presence is just as important as the message itself. The experience of being with God. Maybe even more important than the message itself. These kind of experiences, being in the presence of God in a special way, change us in fundamental ways. It's much deeper than a message. It is an experience of God, an experience of infinite reality and of unconditional love. Usually when we read this story, we assume that the experience on the mountain was for the benefit of John, Peter, and James, not so much for Jesus. It's easy to come to this conclusion because of our very high vision of Jesus that we have now as a manifestation of God. Our very high vision of Jesus is one that benefits from time. It's important to remember that for the most part, when the disciples saw Jesus, they saw a man, not a God. The disciples experienced Jesus as a very special man, but not necessarily as the Word of God in the flesh. Viewing Jesus as our example we shouldn't be surprised that he too would be expected to prepare in some way and that he too needed to work on his spiritual growth and that Jesus himself would have to, yes, work on his relationship with God just as we do. It was in this light that some of the earliest church fathers, some of the earliest and most honored church fathers concluded that this experience, this transfiguration, was preparation mostly for Jesus. It was Jesus who was actively ministering and healing and who needed a recharge, a reconnection with God and the Holy Spirit. These same early church fathers also believed that the transfiguration experience for Jesus was a preparation for resurrection, an experience that prepared Jesus for what was to come. And while it's interesting to ponder this question of how this experience might have impacted Jesus, let's turn our attention to how it impacts us today. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience yourself? Have you ever had an experience in which you sought out and then experienced something extraordinary about God? Some of you have. See a few heads nodding. 
But if not, how would you react if you did? Notice a couple of things about this story. First, the disciples had to trust Jesus enough to leave their homes and follow him up to this point in the story. That took a huge sacrifice. And to climb behind him up this mountainside. This took considerable effort and sacrifice on the part of the disciples. God did not do all the work here. The disciples also did their part. Once the disciples got to the top, where they were tired and the air was thin, they see people talking to Jesus, a couple people. This did not seem like God to them, so they were not afraid. Then a voice interrupts them. That voice is perceived by the disciples as God. They fall to the ground in fear. Next, Jesus touches them. Their fear is gone. They return down the mountain. This provides us a model for spiritual experiences. First, there's effort or a challenge or a life-changing occurrence. Climbing the mountain represents that challenge, that effort. Then, that is followed by an experience of God which changes who we are as a person. Fear is reduced or eliminated by the touch of Jesus and by our increased trust in God. Now, once you've experienced the presence of God, there can be a little bit of a letdown afterwards. Let's face it, when you're at the top of the mountain, no matter which direction you go, it's down. Eventually, we must climb back down the mountain and adjust to life as a different person than what we were when we started. In this context, the command to listen to Jesus is deep and experiential. Notice again, the disciples were already listening to Jesus enough to follow him up the mountain and enough to comf be comforted by him in their fear. The words heard by the disciples, this is my son, listen to him. We're not the main point. But rather, they were a verbal reflection of the experience the disciples were having. A verbal reflection of an experience. In that moment, the disciples received a new ability, a new gift, a new level of perception, a capacity to understand and realize Jesus in life in new ways. The disciples' loyalty, effort, prayer, and surrender to Jesus resulted in a new level of understanding, a new level of awareness. This is an experience that is available to us all. We can follow the same path to improve our perspective, our understanding of God in each moment. And in the process gain an ability to perceive God's presence in the mundane, not just in the extraordinary. Listen to Jesus was experienced as a new level of awareness, not a conscious decision to pay attention. You see the difference? A new level of awareness. In the modern world, mountaintops do not have the same significance. But there are other places and other times where we do go, where we go to encounter the divine. Church is one of those places. And going to church today takes effort, commitment, loyalty, and a willingness to climb a mountain or two if that's what it takes to experience God. Spiritual practices such as prayer, meditation, music, worship, and service to others are the ways that we climb the mountain, that we take responsibility for and put effort into our own spiritual growth. Much of what we do in church is intended to lead us to a mountaintop and to prepare us for what we might encounter there. This has been the work of the church for ages, to usher people along a path of spiritual growth that leads to Jesus Christ, and a mountaintop. Not just one, but sometimes multiple mountaintops as we age, as we learn, 
and as we surrender more completely in Jesus Christ. Our work is that of preparation. We trust in God for the growth. We trust in God for the experience on the mountaintop. The church acts as facilitator for the process, giving us a community of other disciples who are following Jesus the Christ as well. We undertake this journey up the mountain both individually and as a church community. We as a church climb a mountain or two every year to open ourselves to God in new ways. Particularly when the church, like the disciples at the top of the mountain, are gripped with fear. Fear of tomorrow, fear of dying, fear of losing our way. While it's always advisable for the church to pay more attention to Jesus, what the church really needs is an improved ability to perceive and experience Jesus Christ in the world today. An improved ability to experience. In all this noise, technology, and conflict. For that reason, and others, we are embarking on a special Lent season this year. A Lent season that is both about preparing us individually and about preparing our church to climb a mountain of spiritual practice. To open our community up to inspiration, to visions, to dreams, and ultimately to an expanded understanding of reality and our mission together as a church. Sound familiar? The church focused part of this effort is called Revision. Starting this Lent season, which is a beautiful time, by the way, to start this effort, we plan to engage in spiritual practices, just like we do every year at the Lent. But this year is special. Our practices will not just be focused on ourselves, but also on the church and the church's understanding of its mission and its future in Lansing. The process starts with daily devotionals. Daily devotions, praying for the church, Meditating on God's mission for the church are the foundation of the process. These devotional practices represent climbing the mountain. If we can't get that at least close to right, if we can't do that well, then we're going to be sitting at the bottom of the mountain wondering what's going on. we got to get to the top. This focus will continue through Lent and the, and the Easter season. Supported by group meetings, which all members are encouraged to attend. We're not looking for an easy answer. But rather, we are seeking an expanded understanding, a new level of awareness of who and where we are, both as a church and as individuals. That's what we're after. It's very exciting. Opening ourselves up to the mystery of God and the very idea of growing as a church into a new ministry awareness in a new age. This church has been a joy and a spiritual growth center for over 100 years. And maybe, just maybe, God would like to see it continue for another 100 years. Once we establish a new level of understanding, a new ability to perceive what God is doing, the revision process will help us to gather and form a plan to move forward within that understanding. Today's scripture provides a map, one that has been treasured in the Christian church since its inception. Are you ready for Lent? Are you ready for the path of revision and transformation? Let's follow Jesus up the mountain and see what happens. I think we're ready. What do you think? Let's go.